Merry Christmas. I will shoot you. <laughs> Back up when the horse gets it! Here it comes. Hi, bye. I didn't even know you were still on the air. The craziest show to come out this year, Happy. I'd watch it. It's am I have watched it. It's amazing. It's bonkers. It's insane. Thanks. You are an executive producer of it. I am. How did this get started for you? Uh, I was sent the script. Um, I, um, when I read, the, read the, right through it, closed the final page, and I said, what the hell did I just read? And so I talked to Brian Taylor, the executive producer, the, the showrunner, along with Patrick McManus. And, uh, but... Uh, Brian's the one who's directing most of the episodes. And I said, wow, what the hell is this? What is it? Tell me what it's going to be. <laughs> and he just went, and he didn't bullshit me, which I really appreciate. He went, I have no idea. Why don't we just jump in and find out? Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, is that something that excites you when someone says that to you? I've never been told that. So I appreciated the brutal honesty. <laughs> and then, you know, they said that we have Patrick Fischler, and that almost killed the deal. But <laughs> Chris, I'm right here. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, how are you? Good. Patrick Fischler, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, so at any rate, um, yeah. Patrick, you, uh, since Mulholland Drive, you've had, you've had a face that every time you show up in something, I'm, I'm, I'm like, yeah. He's, ah, he's, it's more like that. It's a little like that. But, I, I, you know, it was such a, it's such a night for, I think, a lot of f film goers, film lovers. It was such an iconic moment in movies that sort of, has reigned forever and ever, and I think since then you've also been cast as creeps. Although, Wait, what? What? As what? Creeps. Really? Creep. Yeah. I like them. Do you really? Well, they're more interesting than playing the good guy. Yeah. I mean, thank you very much. You Wait, that wasn't a compliment. <laughs> why, why are you giving him the 20? Uh, I, I like weird characters, and he's going to say this isn't true, but I'm actually incredibly normal in real life. Right, Chris? I have nothing to say. It's your interview. <laughs> See, Go. <laughs> See, I ruined his punchline. Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I gravitate toward that stuff. I also have dark hair and dark eyebrows, so I think that makes me get those kind Naturally. of roles. <laughs> yes, a little bit. Why, why do you think, where do you think it comes from that you gravitate towards those roles and that you play them uh, effectively? I, I just think they're more interesting. I, I, I really always think, you know, the flawed individual, the weirder, the better. I, I think that's just more interesting than sort of the traditional average guy. You the, both kind of get that in this, too. Yeah, well, and I was going to ask, and, and also uh, weigh in, don't you find it more freeing? I find those characters, the, the spectrum um, is, of potential is wide open. I mean, it can be anything you want, you know, to be the hero is, is a far more, at least for me, far more difficult uh, journey to take. Um, you end up being kind of the gateway, the everyman for the audience, and you, well, you can't know, really the do the parameters much. of what's acceptable. You know, you can only push the envelope so far. But the anti-hero to me is, um, I don't know, it's a richer. Which you definitely get to be in this as well. There's some great yeah. moments of you being somewhat villainous as the anti-hero, but then also very goofy. You get to be extremely silly at times with this guy. Yeah, you know, I, I as it evolved. I kept seeing um, the Three Stooges combined with A Christmas Carol, combined with Quentin Tarantino if he were on acid directing, combined with Bugs Bunny. I mean, all of these uh, a mishmash of anarchy, uh, comedy, violence. Um, but, you know, with a, uh, the storyline, the story thread was always very strong, and, and I understood, and I, I saw where the heart of that thread was. When did you realize, I mean, I think it's when you realized that you had a gift for playing sort of psychopaths maybe a little bit. When did you realize that you had a gift for comedy? Very young. I, um, well, I, it was <laughs> quiet. He, he directed the question at me. You'll have your turn. Does he have a gift for comedy? <laughs> <laughs> what were you watching? <laughs> I Look, I, was gonna, I wasn't going to take that. I was going to say, look, physical comedy, I knew immediately. Well, not immediately. As a child, I used to practice opening the door and slamming myself in the face because I'd have my toe here, so it would hit the... And so I worked it on my mother a lot. Be, I'll get it, Mom, and bang, oh! And, you know, did that stuff. Or I would fall intentionally. I'd, I'd trip. I'd trip myself and fall. Are you sure that wasn't just like a sort of issue that you had as a child? <laughs> <laughs> 
that was imagining it. a child in the house just hitting their head and falling. And parents Maybe it was too much sugar. Who the hell knows? Yeah, but that's the story I'm going with. <laughs> Patrick, how did you get involved uh, with the show? Um, Chris begged me to do it. Really? On no, not knees. Um, I got a script and I thought it was uh, really. Can I swear? Yeah, absolutely. Fucking weird. And it really is. awesome though. Not weird just to be weird. Weird because that's where it lives, and that I loved. And then I hate saying this, is this is really challenging for me. But I asked who was playing sax, and they said Chris Maloney. It's okay. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> You're such a fan. <laughs> and to be honest, yes, that was exciting because I think he's incredibly talented. And I thought oh, well, he's going to kill this. And I thought that was what you really needed. If Sax was not someone who could be dramatic and funny and scary and all of those things, and Chris can do all of that. And then Brian, who directed and created the show, is uh, he's like uh, a savant. I mean, he's so incredibly talented. So the look of the show, and it looks like a movie, and yeah. it plays like a movie, that's, that's all Brian. It absolutely plays like a movie, which I, I, I wasn't sure, is it... Is it a series that we can expect beyond to be renewed if it gets renewed beyond the season, or is it like is it a limited series, a mini series? Because it does play like a singular experience, like a movie. Oh no, a series, series for sure. I mean, they have ideas for you know it ends. Not, I won't ruin anything, but yeah. it will. It sets up where we're going, and uh, no, I, it's eight episodes, so they keep it small because I think it's really hard to do. Uh, great 22 hours of television anymore. I think it's hard to do a great 18 or 15 hours. That's why most of the great shows are anywhere between 8 and 12. Well, it's difficult know? to do serialized, but I mean to do procedural or something, you can do 20, you get sure, 50 yeah. writers in a room to come up with different Different ways. stories, yeah. yeah. Uh, when, when it comes to this, were you aware that it was going to look so filmic? Is that something that they talked to you about? No, they didn't speak to me about it, but, you know, just uh, discussing it with Brian Taylor again, you know, he comes from film. So he, he was absolutely outside of his wheelhouse with what procedure, what TV, you know, how the TV structure and schedule works. But uh, his filmatic uh, sensibility was always, you know, at, at the forefront. You know, um, he had a really... Uh, insight into the technical capabilities of all the toys and gadgets that are being invented every day, you know, with film. And so that's definitely something that you get a sense of, because so often I think TV shows right now are trying to present an idea that they are more cinematic, but they're still adhering to a lot of the, the rules of TV. And you can sort of feel those two things at odds with each other. And with this, you don't get that at all. Well, I think where the rubber hits the road with that, the issue is everyone wants a cinematic film experience with TV, but then it's like, well, what's the budget? Yeah. And so, and then here's your budget. What is your technical expertise in squeezing the most out of the dollar and the time that you're being allotted because of the f financial constraints? And that's where, you know, when you get really good people behind the camera and understanding, you know, how they can make their day, as we call it. There, there's also the element sometimes with between TV and film where it's like, how do you make something as atmospheric as a movie while at the same time hitting as many beats as people still feel like TV has to hit in between commercial breaks, you know? I, I, I also credit sci-fi for letting Brian do yeah. everything yeah. he wanted to do. And you, you've, you haven't seen anything yet. The pilot is mellow. <laughs> Compared well, to I mean, show. you get a sense while watching it that there was no one getting in anybody's way while, while making the show. They, they really didn't. And I think Brian not doing television really served us because he, he doesn't know anything other than film. So he didn't, you know, I've done so many TV shows and I've done a lot of crappy TV shows. And you... Name one. No, don't oh do that. God, I could. <laughs> I could name a lot. Um, and you don't... Um, he wasn't worried about coverage and he wasn't worried about if a shot, you know, looked ugly or looked... He just, he just did what he wanted to do. And that doesn't happen on TV a lot. Uh, so I think that really served us. And so because, to me, what permeates the whole set, the, 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 the whole production is freedom. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I, I would blow a take by, well, I'd always blow a take, but by uh, using a curse word. Because I was, I'd be ad-libbing. I mean, oh, fucking hell. Am I allowed to say that again? Yeah. yeah. Like, well, no, I was, I'd say that. I mean, on, that was on him set. on set saying I'm allowed to say that. See, I fooled you. I was acting. Oh. He's so good, Thank you, you guys. You're welcome. Please. You guys clap Hold for him. Your clap. Uh, Everybody clap. No. No. He needs it. He needs it. On, but... Oh God! Oh God! Great, great oh God. work! Great work with Thank the you. acting. Thank so. you. Well, that's about what they pay you at the beginning. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so the, that's what it was, a sense of freedom and um, ad-libbing and, yeah, it was great. How aware of the, uh, or how, did you, did you end up going back and reading the graphic novel uh, once you got cast for the, for the show? Absolutely, I, I wanted to know, where, you know, where the, the genesis, uh, the, the creative genesis was and, and uh, what they were thinking, because, you know, there's our template right there on the page. And, um, you know, so that was very informative. And what was really cool, and this had never happened, was, so, you know, we went to, when I went to costuming, and then we had a great costumer, and I came out in what we had, you know, picked out, and everyone, you know, because the, the uh, Grant Morrison was there, you know, he was the original writer of the of the graphic novel. Everyone stopped and went, "Oh my God, that's Nick Sachs. That's the character." It's really crazy if you haven't seen the cover of the graphic novel. It looks so much like Chris and that outfit, the whole thing. It's 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 pretty cool actually. Yeah. And what about working with uh, Patton as, uh, as Happy? Was that the kind of situation where he came on after you had sort of shot and did, did his voice work? Yeah, and that's all done in a booth. So, uh, you know, I've, I was acting, you know, into thin air, much like when I was doing I, Steve's Attack. Oh, my God. Ah, I, I was... Yeah, yeah, I wasn't, hang, you knew I was coming I for you. You know I was coming for you. You got to leave me hanging? Oh, no, yeah. All right, go on. Don't leave You were me, telling Andy. a story. <laughs> well, Patrick, no, I won't give you a jab. You got something you want to throw at him? Before no, we... it's okay. just too easy a target, so I just let it be. <laughs> Like taking candy from a baby. You were, t you were, you were talking about Patton. Go on. Yeah, no, you know, so Patton does all of his work, the voice of Happy, afterwards. Um, so, in essence, I get to kind of set the tone for the scene. You know, I don't have to, you know, I react to Happy. I'm, list I'm basically listening to a voice in my head, which I, very, I do very often. And, and so it was kind of seamless. There's a, a scene in the first episode without, I don't want to give too much away where you're in an ambulance yeah. and you're convulsing and you're hip, you're hallucinating. Mm -hmm. You've also taken drugs and there's even just, there's just one weird shot where you're kind of like bent like this and sort of doing this weird curve. Like what was shooting that scene like? You're doing so many physical things in that scene. Yeah, it was crazy because, uh, and that, again, that was Brian Taylor. He, you know, so he has me in slow motion, yeah. doing my thing in the midst of a hallucination, while the ambulance attendants are in fast motion. So it yeah. just gives you that sensibility of the whole world is out of whack, and you know, we're, and it's filmed from an outside third, a third person perspective. So and an, as an audience member, you're going, wow, I don't know what's going on here, and that's, that was the, the intent. It's not my perspective or their perspective, it's a... Multiple perspectives, yeah. right? You know, they're running around, so you just know that the whole world in this universe, this reality that we've introduced, is changing. It's going somewhere else. And then you're introduced to this character, and you don't know, and so hopefully you're with Nick Sachs going, wait, 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 wait. what am I watching now? That You have that sensation yeah. of, I, I don't understand what's going on. Great then you're in the perfect place. That's what we meant for you to feel. And the sh whole show kind of keeps that up a little bit. It slowly explains yes. a little bit. Do you want to actually try and to... And to Patrick's point, you ain't seen nothing yet. It continues to morph into places where you're going, I don't, I'm not sure what this reality is. It's not predictable in yeah. any capacity, which is also hard for TV and for film. I think For anything not, now. Yeah, yeah, to not know where it's going. And I, we would get scripts and... Text you and just be like, oh my God, did you read seven? And it's, yeah, oh shit. So you guys text each other. You guys are friends. No. Nope. No. No. I text his manager because I don't want to go through him. <laughs> he texts my people, my people it tell me, him, and yeah. I ignore his text. Yeah. <laughs> did you guys have fun, have fun working together? Was one of the things? Okay, no. Just go ahead. I, now it's my turn, and you can hold me if you want. You know, I, I knew who he was, and so I was thrilled. My, the first. I said he was perfect for the role, you know. <laughs> and we and you know we had the scene. We didn't do much talking. You just kind of you know very professional. Hey, how you doing? You know, I love you, great. And uh, our, the scene was, you know, when you, you as an actor, you, you feel it. You know you're in safe hands because all acting is to me is you throw something at someone, and if they catch it, and then they throw it back in a different whatever way they, and all of a sudden you're playing catch with someone. And it doesn't matter how you throw it at them, you're, you're, ex you're expecting, you're anticipating something great, whatever it is. 
And that's always exciting. It keeps the scene alive. Listening and responding. That's, yeah, that's, and that didn't happen with Patrick. <laughs> so, oh, I thought this was about me. Who did it happen with, Chris? He's talking about acting with himself. When yes, when I was doing all my that's happy stuff. That's what he normally stuff. talks about. It was magic acting with me. So wonderful. I'm so <laughs> perfect and in the moment. Yeah, he's like, I'm such I a good I love that. Yeah, that's a great God. timing of that voice yeah. in my head. <laughs> No, but it was funny because the scene in the pilot that we have, and uh, oh, we're this close. Yeah, which show. isn't in the script. That it, it's not yeah. written that we play it like that. I just thought that would be fun because he's you know strapped down, and uh, it just was fun to play right away. And do you walked in, you're like, I'm gonna get right here. Well, it's funny. Brian Taylor said to me, a lot of great guys were up, were up for smoothie. Uh, he goes, but I had a weird feeling you and Chris were going to have good chemistry. And this was before we shot. So I was like, oh, shit, what if we don't? And then... <laughs> and action. Yeah, it kind of was. I'm like, oh, I guess I got to have chemistry. Uh, but it just happened. And it is funny because it, it plays in that, in that um, first episode. And then you'll get to see more of that later. Uh, you know, Patrick, I have to ask, we're talking about, like, really great TV, and uh, this, this is an incredible sort of entry in, in good TV right now. But you were also just a part of Twin Peaks, yeah. which was... For my mind, the wildest thing television has ever done. Yeah, it's just, it was just completely bonkers. And as a Lynch fan, I loved it. What was that like for you guys to to shoot it? It, it, it? I think Lynch is the greatest man in the world. I mean, I really mean that. I would drop anything to work with him. I think it's it's. Um, Have you just done Mulholland and, and Peaks? Uh, Twin Peaks? That was it. And Twin so, Peaks was also kind of like all of the faces from as many movies as he could muster together. Of his, I think he know? kind of reached out to anyone he liked working with, I guess, and said, hey, you want to do this? And so uh, we only got our pages. So I, don't, I, I had no idea what it was. I, don't, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I didn't know anything connected to the rest of the show. So when I watched it, I was like, lucky that I guess I made sense of something that I got, you know, just my scenes. Everybody did except Kyle. Everyone only got their scenes. Because, um, like, I had a day with Jennifer Jason Lee, and I said, so you've read all of this. She said, no, I just read my pages. That's all they gave me. You know, and she was nominated for an Oscar that year. It was Hateful Eight year. Um, but she had the same experience. She's like, I'm kind of just guessing and hoping it works. And that's what sort of people did. But he's so great, and he just knows exactly what to tell an actor and to make an actor feel comfortable and uh, he believes in it. He loves actors. I've, I've heard that his directions a lot of times are just slower. <laughs> yeah, it's, that makes it, all, yes, it is, but he, he really just says simpler. That's his biggest thing. And that's what he told me on Mulholland Drive and I was 27 at the time and I remember that changed my life. It's simpler. He just was, you know, sort of, you're telling a, a, you had a bad dream. You're just telling your bad dream. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And so I did it differently. Uh, and so going into Twin Peaks, it was just great to see him. And so how has the, the direction of Simpler affected you as you've, as you've acted over the course of years? I mean, especially in doing a character like this where you could be sort of twisting the mustache and playing a, a, a big, broad villain. Does, do you still think Simpler when you go into it? Always. And TV often doesn't let you be simple. That's the thing. And I, Brian and our directors, they let me be simple. And there were sometimes it did, Smoothie did go off into mustache twirly, and Brian would be like, what the hell are you doing? I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry. That's how Brian directs. It's like, you know, what you know when Brian doesn't like what you're doing. Um, but uh, it's, it's informed everything for me. I, I, I just, I try to be as simple as possible because, you know, you let this do it for you a lot of the time. And that, you know, I'll teach you about this after. We'll have a little master class. I, I kind of zoned out. What did you say? <laughs> I was talking about how good you are. Um, oh, I'm all ears. <laughs> uh, no, so it's, it's informed a lot of, of uh, where I've been since then, you know. Uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Who has a question? Um, hi. Hi. I have a question. I know you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you plan on doing any movies next year, or are you going to stick with TV for now? Uh, I, I don't know. I think right now um, we're kind of anticipating, well, I think we're anticipating a, a pickup, I think. I hope so. Uh, You'll get it. It's amazing. So, thanks. Yeah. So I, I think actually all uh, energies will be focused for season two. So I don't foresee the film thing. But isn't that enough for you? It's a full season of TV. It's not. <laughs> uh, next question. Hi. Um, so I believe this is uh, Grant Morrison's first uh, creation that's been turned into live action. And uh, you mentioned that he was there in the beginning. Was he involved, do you know, in the script at all or during the production? Y yeah, so <clears throat> uh, I was in the writer's room uh, 
for a good portion of the time. And so even though he wasn't uh, familiar with how a writer's room works for television or anything else of that nature, his insight into the overarching themes, you know, uh, good versus evil, light and dark, and that interplay it was almost, he helped remind everybody of the uh, mythic template that he always wanted to, uh, to he, that he was trying to establish with the, the, the graphic novel. I mean, uh, to me, it was very profound. Because, you know, I've seen, or, you know, I've been in writer's rooms, uh, and that's just, that's just not how they think. In these almost in these mythic ways, uh, Joseph Campbell-esque ways, and it was it, it was very helpful. I thought he, he's an incredible guy. Yeah, by the way, he's fascinating. You could sit and talk to him for hours and never be bored. And I want to make sure we give him credit that this all of that started with him. You know, the the graphic novel is pretty great, and so uh, Grant is is awesome. What made you want to executive produce this and and be in the writers' room? Control, you know. I mean, I mean, you know, honestly, I mean, you know, know. actors. As an actor, they, they, my experience has been they prefer to just to kind of put you in that place and keep you there, and and sometimes I think it's. um, Let me just say, I think they do it for convenience. You know, you play that thing, we'll play this thing. Everyone has their job to do. So then, you know, once you get... There's an immediate assumption on the part of others in the production process that when the actor speaks about something, even if it's about their role, I think actors feel an eye roll or something like, oh, uh, here we go, like, he's there, they want this, and it's like a really insecure place for there's, actors to be in. There's an assumption of uh, any time an actor opens their mouth, uh, there's, uh, they're, gonna, they're self-serving yeah. themselves. It, you know, it's almost as if they're... they're um, Overshadowing. They, they they want they always want uh, more lines or, and so it takes a while for them to for you to gain their trust and say I'm I'm really my my focus my interest is on the project because if the project doesn't work if if it's a shitty project and I'm the lead actor on a shitty project you know I'm not going to be happy no one's going to be happy about that and and I've already been there you know with with a variety of things so um, yeah that's why I did it so that I could get into the rooms with the adults. They like to call themselves the adults, and we're children. Hi. And, and yeah, so that's why I did it. I, I'm not a producer on the show, but... Uh, no. I, I never will be, but they um, <clears throat> were so collaborative, everybody. And that went for, I'd say, any actor in this show would agree. I, I, I've never had that before on a TV show, especially a first season of a show. Brian and Patrick McManus, uh, Chris, everybody was so collaborative and listened to us. And we were like, you know what, this doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Like I would, I'd get a script and I would tell Brian, this section doesn't make sense. He goes, yeah, you're totally right. And then the day before I'd get a new monologue. Yep. And I'd be like, And oh, it, show, it yeah. showed, and even on the, and ad-libbing, like once we had it, what, what was on the page, once we got that, then they'd say, okay, let's do a couple takes, just ad-libbing, and you, just whatever you want. Whatever Which is another thing a lot of shows don't let you do. I, I feel a like- show like this, too. <clears throat> like, it's a rarity that I think in a show this stylistic and this plot-driven that you would get the chance to do stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And I really think the, the greatest thing about this show is it is so not what you think it is. Even though it is, you'll watch that trailer, but there's a lot more to this. And I just showed my wife's parents the pilot. They're in their mid-80s. And I just showed them the pilot yeah. in, over Thanksgiving. And I said, you're going to hate this, because I knew it wasn't for them. My wife was like, she was on True Blood for five years, and they hated it. They just would always say to her, oh, you're the only thing we like about it, honey. And then, (laughs) seriously. So I was just like, I don't want to show them this, but they wanted to see it. So I came down after they'd watched it, and they genuinely loved it. And what they said is, her mom was like, the minute the flying blue creature came in, I knew everything was going to be okay. And everyone I cared about on the show was going to be okay. Oh my God. I swear to God. And they genuinely, because they're not, they're not going to BS me. I thought that was so amazing that she said that. And they were so excited to see the next one. So it really is going to cross. I hope people give it a chance because it's not. No, you're absolutely right. There is something about like I watched the trailer last <clears throat> night and I was kind of like, oh, I got, I get this. And then they sent me the episode and I watched this morning. And within three minutes of the episode, I was like, no, I don't get, this is so much different and even better than I thought it, thought it could be. The way that it looks, the tone that it takes, the jokes. It's, it's just, it's great, mm-hmm. you know? A trailer, a, no kind of trailer could sell 
this is for as good as it is. Everything you know? it is. Well, because it's more than one thing. It's yeah. really layered. And you'll see as you watch, there's a real heart to it. And I don't think things can exist if you don't care. And there's a definite caring here. So I like that. Congratulations as a producer. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, God, we're back to that again? One and done. <laughs> <laughs> one and done is that. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Hi. Um, Hi. Just pop right on up. And then he did you. Yeah. Hi. Is there an elevator? Well, sort of, not. sort of. Um, so I was wondering, like, since this was shot in uh, New York, uh, for you, Chris, I know you got to shoot um, SVU in New York as well. Like, what was it like, you know, like coming back to the sea to shoot uh, Happy? Like coming home. I, you know, I'm in LA right now, but boy, you know, and I, I, I've been unapologetic about it. You know, I, I love LA, but you know, I belong in New York, and uh, you know, it's that thing of, you know, I had this moment when I was a young man. Uh, I'll never ha forget this feeling coming up out of the steps of a subway and seeing New York for the first time, going, "Oh my God, I was born here. This is where I belong. This is, I'm psychically, you know, grounded here." Anyway, that's it. So it was great. And also, I got to spend a lot of time in Brooklyn. I used to be allergic to Brooklyn. <laughs> I love Brooklyn. I was like, oh, my God. It was banging. Brooklyn's great, man. Trust me. You know, I was, you know, I was here in the early to mid-'80s. Fair. So, no. <laughs> I lived in Carroll Gardens when it was Carroll Gardens. It wasn't good. Yeah. And, you know, now it's, every place is so hip. Yeah, with everyone with the beards. So you sound bad. really old. What? I couldn't nothing, hear you. Nothing. What? Nothing. What? Selleck says the same thing when he's shooting Blue Blood Detection. No, I love that Selleck. There's an actor's oh, actor. Uh, guys, I love the show. Congratulations. Happy premieres Wednesday night, December 6th on Sci Fi. What time? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock on Sci-Fi. Congratulations. Give them a round of applause, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you.